So I'm here to give you like a little info burst about multiple sclerosis. And I guess you, there's so many of you here, I, I realize that you're al already the expert. So I'm probably just giving you a, a revision of what you already know. So what's multiple sclerosis? This, that's what I want to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so. I guess one thing about multiple sclerosis, it, it is, it's a disease and it's not a, you know, a good disease. And when you kind of learn information, you've got to be very careful about where you get your information from and how, you, how quickly you assimilate that knowledge. Because obviously it's a bit like an onion. It has many different layers and you have to appreciate there are many layers. And if you peel the onion too quick, Sometimes you might not want to hear the information. It's also important to realize that some of the information was generated before we had any treatments. And so the reality of today may not be the reality of the information that you read. Now, what we first need to understand about multiple sclerosis is, is essentially it's like a tube map. It's like a network. And if you view this brain as a tube, this is the neural network, so basically we're just a bag of nerves. And the, the tube lines are essentially the nerves going from different parts of your body. The tube trains are the, the nerve signals. The people in the trains getting off at the stations are what really drives the trains to go from um, different parts. And we have stations where we can interconnect to, to change our direction. And essentially that's how the nervous system works. And what happens in multiple sclerosis is there are problems with the, the train network. Now, in terms of the nervous system, we can kind of base it into two parts, the brain, the eye, and the spinal cord, which is the central nervous system, which is the bit affected by multiple sclerosis. And then there are nerves feeding off the, brain, off the spinal cord, which are called the peripheral nerve, nervous system, and they're not really affected by multiple sclerosis. Now, the brain is a very complex or organ, and different parts of the brain control different functions. So this bit here is the cerebellum, and that controls balance and movement. That bit there would be where your vision is processed. Some of the more um, emotional bits are at the front of the brain. And so the point is, if we then take a slice of the brain here, you can see this bit. So if, if MS was affecting the bit at the bottom, it may be affecting your tongue. Just a bit further up, if you had a lesion of MS, it could be affecting your hand. And so this is why MS can do so many different things. It's because depending where MS attacks the nervous system, depending on the different signs and symptoms that can materialize. Now, how does the uh, information uh, transmit from you know, say we have a hot sense, we go ouch and move our hand away. How does that information get transmitted? It gets transmitted through nerves. So it starts off maybe with a signal in a, in a nerve cell. You can have the, the neuron, which is the nerve cell body. The nerve impulse then traffics down the, the axon, and then it'll get to a gap called a synapse, where the, the nerve impulse has to jump across the gap and then it goes along down to the next nerve. And the reason why um, the nerves can work so fast is because of this insulating sheath that wraps around the, um, the axon, and this is called myelin. It's like a fatty insulation material, and it's made by a cell called the oligodendrocyte. And the problem with multiple sclerosis is that the oligodendrocyte is attacked. It, it gets attacked and it stops making myelin, and that causes what we call demyelination. And that can be seen in this slide here. So you can see the brown stain is myelin, and you can see areas of white. And that is where the myelin has been lost because the oligodendrocytes have been attacked. And that causes the problems of multiple sclerosis. Now, if we look in the top corner here, you can see a nerve impulse jumping. Did you see that? There it goes again. So this is how quickly a nerve impulse comes, and it jumps across those myelin sheaths. Now, on this side, you can see a demyelinated nerve. Here's the demyelination, and you can see how the nerve impulse is traveling very, very slowly. So just to think that we have movements and, and thoughts to coordinate, if you know, part of the nerve isn't 
uh, functioning as well as it can, you can see that there's a, a discoordination, and that will lead to signs and symptoms of MS. So that's one of the central reasons why we have problems in MS, is just that the nerves aren't signaling in the way that is optimal. So another way to view the signal is as an electrical impulse, like a wire, and what happens is that the insulation of the wire is removed. And what we have with MS is the MS monster, which is there to damage the, the nerves and the electrical wires. So what we need to do is think about how we get that, uh, kill that MS monster. Somebody would say it's a vampire, so you can kill it with light. So Prof G will uh, tell you about vitamin D, perhaps. Now, what happens with multiple sclerosis, the, the signs and symptoms can be very varied, and that just depends on where the, the MS attacks. So, um, if it can affect your uh, sensory, so you, uh, it's how you feel things, so you can have numbness, pins and needles. If you had uh, lesions in the cerebellum, it will affect your uh, balance and coordination. In your optic nerve, it can affect your vision. Uh, bladder, it can affect continence. So, the effects of MS can be very, very varied just because where in the nervous pathway that the MS uh, occurs. Now, one of the questions you will ask is, why me? And it's a complex interaction. One is a, there's a genetic component. Two, there's an environmental factor. And three, there is kind of the unknown, the chance. So what about the genetics? Well, what I can say is, one of the genes that affects multiple sclerosis is the sex chromosomes. There are more females with MS than there are males. So in the UK, it's about two to one. In Iran, it's six females for every one male. Now, there are some genes, but I will say there is no MS gene. There is no gene that you have that will give you MS. But one of the main ones is a thing called the human leukocyte antigen, which is used for, in CSI, for DNA, uh, DNA fingerprinting. Um, and that is involved in recognition of, of bacteria and, and viruses. And that is one of the genes that is, is involved in multiple sclerosis, suggesting there's an immune component. Now, the gene that uh, is associated with MS is very, very common in Northern Europeans. So many of us, whether you have MS or not, uh, will have these genes. And we know there's about 150 genetic variants that we've identified so far. Uh, and there's probably about another 300 to find. Now, the important point is if, if I was an identical twin, my other twin would have a 70% chance that they would never get MS. And if I have a parent with MS, there's a 98% chance that my children won't get MS. So, you know, just having the gene is not going to make you get MS. Now, one of the problems you have um, in terms of why you get MS is that you live in MS Central. So the UK has got the highest incidence of multiple sclerosis in the world. So in areas of Scotland, one in 350 people will get MS. Now what you'll notice from this graph, you can see the red areas, which is where the high incidence of MS is. So if you go north, you get MS, you can see the red. And if you go south, you can Tasmania and New Zealand, you get MS. And you'll notice that MS is more common the further you get away from the equator. And one of the suggestions of that is something to do with sunlight. And one of the things that sunlight does is it, is it produces vitamin D, which is involved in bone health, but it can also influence some of the immune genes. Now, there are a, a number of different risk factors. Um, one of the other things that appears to associate with MS is Epstein-Barr virus. Most people with MS have Epstein-Barr virus. Most people without MS also have Epstein-Barr virus. There's another thing called human endogenous retrovirus, which is a virus that is in our genome. All of us have that. So it could be a very, very common trigger. And some of those things we can't do much about. One of the things you can do is smoking. You can make sure that you, your children don't smoke. And that will cut their risk down of getting a MS by, by a half. So, how do we describe MS? I'll have to read it myself. So, pathologically, it's an inflammatory disease of the central nervous system, causing demyelination with evidence of axon, that's the nerve uh, thing, uh, 
damage with gliosis. This is a scar formed by the astrocytes. And clinically, what we have to see is episodes of, of, of neurological dysfunction in time. So the diagnosis of MS is lesions in time and space. And we can see that here, where there are a lesion there, lesion there, lesion there, there, and there. These are repairing lesions. This is the, the early lesions. So we can see they're in different spaces. And because of their different ages, we can kind of start to make a, a diagnosis of MS. Now, when you do get a diagnosis of MS, you may be tight. And the clinicians will use a, a scoring system called EDSS to assess how well you're doing. So if you're not, you're very healthy. If you're uh, EDSS 6, you're kind of walking with a cane. And this is just a way that neurologists kind of uh, get an assessment of how your MS is progressing. And when you get multiple sclerosis, the course of disease can be in different flavors. So in about 85% of people, you have attacks and then get better. You get attacks and then get better. That's called relapsing remitting MS. And then in the majority of cases, many years later, the, the disease will become secondary progressive. So the disease will slowly get worse without any um, remissions. Now, in about 10 to 15% of cases, particularly if you're male, older, or non-white, you have a, a higher risk of starting with this progressive phase straight from onset. Now, that may be superimposed with relapses, and we've now got treatments that clearly affect the relapsing element of MS. We're only starting to get into the era of thinking about treatments for the progressive phase, but we may hear some more about that today. Now, these are old figures, so remember about the onion. So if you have your first symptom of MS, there's an 80% chance that in 20 years' time, you will be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and another 20 years on from that, there's an 80% chance that you will develop secondary progression. So the mean time to the walking stick is about 20 20 years. The median time to using a wheelchair is about 30 years. Now, this is the important point. These figures were done before treatments. And we are now in the era of treatments. And so, if you have a treatment, these effects are going to be much later. And hopefully, if we start early enough, they may not occur at all. So what happens in MS? Now, this is a nerve, a, a slice of a brain. So the red is the, the axon, and the green is the myelin. And here you can see a little blood vessel in the middle. And this is an MRI. I guess you'll see these. This is called a T1-weighted image. And the way to kind of get that is that the fluid-filled space, which is the ventricles, are black. OK? So what is one of the first signs of MS? Is white blood cells start to enter the central nervous system this causes uh, a lesion within the central nervous system. And if we were to use a contrast agent called gadolinium, you can see the, the big white blob and the big white blob, they're MS lesions. And there's another one here. Now, what will happen is they will expand a bit. So you get damage to the myelin in the middle, and then you have this active rim where you have these macrophages. These are goblin cells that gobble up the... Um, the myelin, you can see here they're red because that's the lipid inside the macrophage. And here, if you look at the uh, MRI, you can see the ring of the lesion. Can you see that there? So eventually, after two weeks to about four to six weeks, the lesion kind of is controlled, and you have a demyelinated lesion. So here's the myelin in black around the axon. And in MS, you can see the demyelinated axon. So you can see that that black ring is gone. Now, there's different things that can happen after this. Now, one thing is that it doesn't repair, and it scars. And there's a cell called the astrocyte, which is in yellow, which makes the scar, and that's called sclerosis. And that's why MS is called multiple sclerosis, because you have multiple scars. Now, here you can see in this T1 image, you can see that black blob. That's called a T1 black hole, which is suggestive of, of an old lesion. 
Now, the other thing is, this is a T2-weighted image where the, the, the fluid is kind of bright and white. And what you can see is that lesions come and go. And for every clinical attack, you may be able to find about 10 uh, lesions. <laughs> now, what can happen with those uh, lesions is the default is to repair. And so we get what we call remyelination. And you can see this here. There's a demyelination. Here's a remyelinated uh, thing where the, the myelin is much thinner than in the normal. Now, one potential problem is if we don't get the, the myelin on, is that there may be nerve death. Now, here's a, one of the bits of the onion you don't want to see. But if you look at the ventricle here, you can see that with time that the ventricle gets bigger. And that's because one of the problems of progressive MS is that there is nerve damage. So really what we want to do is to stop that happening. Now, we all lose nerves. That's part of aging. It's just in MS, it happens at a quicker rate. So in summary, we have the attacks. And underlying the attacks, we have these um, lesions occurring in the brain. Eventually, what happens is progression seems to take hold. And that's associated with increasing nerve damage. And then the relapse is associated with the, the immune attack. And as a consequence of the damage, we start to get more signs and symptoms that need treating. So how do we approach the treatment of MS? So what we really want to do is we want to stop the inflammation. And we're, getting, we're very good at, at doing that now. What we want to do is save the nerves that are demyelinated. And then we can think about repairing, which is remyelination. And in many cases, all we have to do is stop the inflammation and then the natural repair mechanisms will actually repair the damage. So we don't have to think necessarily about stem cells, but we are thinking about stem cells. And at the top, in the future, hopefully we'll be able to repair damaged nerves. Now, what are the treatments of multiple sclerosis? There are a number. Essentially, there are two approaches. One is called an induction. So what you do is you're taking a, a, a highly uh, kind of immune-depleting drug. It blocks the, the immune cells, it kills them off for many years, and you only have to give a short course. But obviously, there's a risk because you're um, removing parts of your immune system, so you have risk of infections. And with this particular drug, there are um, autoimmunities that may occur. Now, on the other side, you may prefer to start with something that's less aggressive. So we have beta interferons, the uh, glutarium acetate, Abadja or Tecfidera. And essentially, all these drugs that are above here try to stop the immune system arriving in the brain. And if you don't arrive in the brain, then you can't cause damage. And if those fail, then you can use more aggressive uh, drugs, such as Jelenia or Tysabri, and they have increasing efficacy, but with increasing efficacy comes the risk of more side effects. But what we want to achieve is a thing called no evidence of disease activity, because if your disease isn't active, then it's unlikely that you will progress. Now, with the drugs having side effects, there are risks. And one way to get your risk is to read about it. So one of the things uh, we do and this is our research blog, is we put what are the risks of the infections. So you have to have the knowledge so you can make the choice about which treatment you want to do. So this is the research blog that we run. Every day we'll do a research report. This is kind of the typical way. And we'll comment about uh, drugs or, or research for the day. And importantly, it allows you to do a question and answer because importantly, there are no stupid questions. So really, if you don't know the, 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 the answer, ask it, because we'd be sure that be many other people will, will uh, want to know the answer too. So I started off with the, the tube map, which is uh, here. And with knowledge, you'll kind of get to understand that the tube map is a bit more complicated. And um, Professor Giovanoni will be telling you eventually the information at each one of these tube stops. And as it's a research day, and there are lots of researchers that will be around, maybe you've got their thing in front of them so you know who they are, 
so you can ask them questions. So I'll stop there. Here's a summary, um, and I'll leave that there. Probably, if there's time for questions, I'll have them, or, or you can ask the researchers. So thank you. There's one rule in medicine, which is if you're doing well on a medication, it's probably a good idea not to change. If it's not, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, sort of, yeah, absolutely. I think unless one got something really fantastic and compelling that was uh, going to do better without any, any additional problems. Thank but, you. Uh, but, and always, the second thing we always say is have a chat with your friendly neurologist about it as well. Uh, absolutely, thank you. The age of onset does affect um, disability on the population scale. So if you have MS and develop MS at a, a later age, there is a chance that your MS will progress more quickly in terms of progressive disease. But on an individual basis, it's very, very difficult. So, you know, you can have a very young person that will do badly. You can have a very old person that will do very well. So. I think the problem with MS is it's so different and everybody's journey can be different. So on a population level, we can make suggestions, but on the individual level, I don't think I can anyway. No, I don't think that's fair. <laughs> we, we always have to blame somebody for, yeah. for this. So I leave that question to David. Is it the Vikings? Well, I guess that's one of the ideas is if you look, where is MS? then it's where the Vikings kind of came, and then it's where the British went. So we kind of took it to America, and we kind of took it to Australia. So the thing is, the, the genes are very common, and they're involved in normal human function. There's nothing abnormal about them. It's just the way that they come together makes you at risk of MS. So there's nothing very, abnormal about it. I found it very useful when my doctor told me that I was not responsible for anything that happened to my children I could blame the Vikings. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, they're partially responsible for that and many other things. Yeah. Okay.